the public chat too. All right. All right. It looks like we're live. Hello, everyone. And Hi. hello, Jeff Alderman. So my name's Sean Latham. I'm the Pauline McFarland Walter Professor of English and Comparative Literature at the University of Tulsa and the director of the Oklahoma Center for the Humanities, the ongoing host for these Humanities Happy Hour events that we're running every Thursday night at five o'clock uh, through a live stream here on Facebook. And if you happen to miss it on Facebook, or if you know people are uh, not able to attend, but still wanna follow up on the conversation, these are all recorded and kept on our YouTube channel and on uh, our social media channels like Facebook as well. So you'll always be able to follow along even if you can't attend every happy hour event. Uh, I wanna say just a few words about the Oklahoma Center for the Humanities and about some of the aspects of this, uh, this series that we're running here um, before we get to tonight's event. Um, so as I said, at least through the next several weeks, we'll be running these every Thursday night at five o'clock. Uh, we're busily putting together the things that will come next. We anticipate a, uh, a trivia contest, actually, where you'll be able to sign up in, in teams for next week. Uh, and we're working on a, on a Dylan-related event that we hope will follow shortly after that. Uh, we're also doing several other events, uh, including every Friday at uh, Around noontime, we post something called Friday with the Fellows, in which we've asked former and current uh, research fellows at the Oklahoma Center for the Humanities to post uh, events and activities that might take you into your weekend. And currently, we have three guest uh, bloggers that are providing this content, uh, and they're rotating around between uh, uh, creating a weekend playlist. Uh, these are created by Katie Moulton, a, a Kaiser Artist Fellow here, uh, and Lane Farman, who's one of the OCH student fellows. Uh, Edgar Frias, who's another artist fellow here in Tulsa, who will create uh, Friday meditations uh, that will help take you into the weekend. And then this weekend, we have our new poster, David Chandler, uh, a former uh, PhD student at TU, who is also uh, uh, an expert in board games. And he'll be posting a series on board games that you can play uh, while in isolation with your family and uh, even alone. Uh, finally, we've also put together something we're calling the COVID Cabaret, uh, in which we've asked, this is April is National Poetry Month, and we've asked uh, faculty members in English and in languages uh, and our students as well to read and comment on poems that they think might speak particularly powerfully to these times. Uh, the first of these videos was just posted today, uh, so you can find those on Facebook and on our Humanities Center website at humanities.utulsa.edu, uh, and there you'll find uh, seven members of the English faculty reading poems and commenting on them uh, to share with the world that they're using to get through these difficult confuse and confusing times. Now, one feature of the Humanities Happy Hour, of course, is that uh, we each week are trying to feature a custom cocktail created by a local bartender uh, or a restaurateur. Uh, and this week we have a terrific cocktail actually created for us by Eric Franzen at Shuffles uh, in the Arts District downtown. Uh, and there's a video on how to make these. You can find it online. It's actually terrific. Uh, and if you haven't seen Eric's video, I urge you to take a look at it. He dresses up in full um, protective gear in order to mix this thing. It's a hilarious and uh, entertaining video. And the cocktail itself is called a, a Don't Touch My Face. Happen to have one right here. Uh, and uh, it's a combination of rum and various juices all muddled together with some basil leaves. It tastes like spring. It's absolutely delicious. And so as I'll now, and I'll do this again periodically throughout tonight's broadcast, I wanna remind you to tip your bartender. So you can visit Shuffles, there's a link here in the chat. Uh, toss a little bit of money to your bartender if you would. This, these are difficult times for everyone in the service industry in particular, who is completely idled by the COVID crisis. Uh, and Eric also offers you some other entertaining ways to support Shuffles, including board game rentals that you can arrange through the store and a terrific t-shirt with Dungeons and Dragons dice on the front. I've already ordered myself uh, one of those, so I urge you to take a look at those. And I hope you'll sip your cocktails as we begin our conversation tonight. In fact, I'll take a sip of mine right now. So for tonight's event, uh, we decided to have a conversation about the art, science, and medicine behind the 2011 film Contagion. If you have any kind of streaming service, you'll realize that this film in particular has surged to the top of nearly every most popular list. Um, Apple, I think Netflix, uh, Amazon, you can see it up there. It's just the movie everyone wants and everyone is trying to watch. Uh, because uh, even though it's a decade old, it allows us to use this piece of fiction to look collectively um, at our own current circumstances, to see what 
what's what this film sort of says about us, um, what seems right, what seems wrong. It's become a really interesting thing to talk about. And as part of that conversation, I've asked tonight uh, my colleague, Dr. Jeff Alderman, to join us for a conversation and interview in which we'll talk about the film and answer some of your questions as well. So the way we'll do this a little bit up front, we'll do a little bit of interview among ourselves. I strongly encourage you to ask your questions in the uh, Facebook chat on the side, both Dr. Alderman and I can see it. So we'll try to respond to those in real time uh, as well as you ask them. I hope you've watched the film in advance or or seen it at some time in the past. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the filmmaking aspects as well as some of the medicine and science in the film and urge you to, to join us as well. And we anticipate that conversation spiraling out to include things like um, how we're dealing with the COVID crisis now, what the film got wrong, how it might be changing or at least shaping the way people like Dr. Alderman are teaching their students in uh, in in college courses and presumably uh, medicine courses right now as well. So I do wanna say a few words about Dr. Alderman. We're very lucky to have him here. He's an expert uh, in this field. He's the Associate Professor of Community Medicine and the Director of the Institute for Healthcare Delivery Science and the Oxley College of Health Sciences at the University of Tulsa. Uh, he has a BA from Johns Hopkins University and his medical degree from George Washington University and, in, and a Master's of Science in Healthcare Delivery Science. He's board certified in internal medicine and has a specialty in palliative, palliative and hospice care as well. In other words, we've brought in a real expert to talk about today's film, a conversation that we will, as I said, we'll look at the science um, and the art of, in some sense of the pandemic crisis and how it's already influencing our lives. So welcome Jeff to this conversation. I should try to call you Dr. Alderman, but I'll inevitably call you Jeff because we happen to be friends and you live just down the street, but we're doing a good job of social distancing by, uh, by still doing this through our computers. Well, thank you, Sean, so much for having me. Thank you to the audience. I'm just thrilled to be here, uh, honored to be invited. And uh, I like walking by your house and we always give you guys a wave when we go on our walks. Um, oh, good, yeah, we, we do the same. <laughs> I, I don't have a, uh, a good cocktail like you have. I just have some American Solera, all the sports tonight. And uh, it's very nice to be sitting here with a, with a drink uh, talking about uh, COVID-19. So <laughs> it's probably and, the only way to talk about the pandemic right now is with a drink in hand. <laughs> I think so. I think so. Well, th this really is life imitates art, right? Or art imitates life. Um, th there was a lot in this film that uh, seemed very real. And uh, uh, I think a lot of people like myself found it very relatable to what's going on right now. And um, I know that when I, I read a review of the film, the producers, some of the actors, uh, actresses, writers, they actually spent a little bit of time doing research in epidemiology and looking at um, uh, the issue of pandemic control and, and how does a nation respond. So I, I think that really helped uh, give some of the accuracy and reality to the film. Uh, it also was very entertaining. Uh, it, it hyperlinked along from scene to scene. <laughs> I guess that's true of Soderbergh's films in general, traffic and whatnot. Um, but you know, the things that made my hair stand up on the back of my neck was that we started to see things that we can relate to right now that we haven't seen before, like hearing about a, a virus that started in China from a bat uh, that is making its way all over the world, uh, where they had scenes of empty malls, uh, an empty airport, and that transmission of this virus, this MEV1 virus that they showed in the film, uh, was transmitted the same way that uh, COVID-19 is transmitted, really uh, through respiratory droplets. And uh, you can find it, and they use the term um, fomites, which are basically inanimate objects, everything from a countertop to a towel. And that's very similar uh, to how COVID-19 is transmitted. Um, we heard some terms in the film that uh, maybe some of us hadn't uh, been used to or heard before. Social distancing came up, um, which is something we're all kind of used to now, but probably not a lot of us had that ready uh, in, the, in the tip of our tongue before. They uh, quoted the r naught, which is a uh, epidemiologic measure of spread of infection. And they kept saying things like, wash your hands, don't touch your face, things that we're inundated with today. Uh, so I, I thought it was a, a great film, a little bit anxiety provoking, just to how much it mirrored what's going on. Um, but, uh, Maybe, maybe some ideas about the future. I, I don't know. Yeah, and uh, I was surprised when we were setting up for this. You said that you had never seen this film actually until until just now, right? This was your first viewing of it. That, that's correct. And I heard yeah. uh, that the two films out there, Contagion and Outbreak, this is the better one. <laughs> I haven't seen that. Uh, 
both actually have all-star casts. Like, there's something, and they both came out roughly at the same time. Outbreak was a bit earlier, but it is curious that there was, this, this must have been around some of the emergence of Ebola 10 years ago, I imagine, that was creating this early sense of anxiety. And it, at least it, in my sense, it gave me at least some comfort, as you said, to hear these sort of these familiar phrases and things like social distancing and don't touch your face that that there actually is something like a plan that had been in place we weren't we weren't staring exactly into something that was completely unknown this as you said the fiction is actually eerie in the way that it anticipates at least some aspects of the current crisis oh absolutely and uh, you know so one of the other things i think the film really got right was that you had this tremendous sense of dread uh, as you watched it you there was a real sense of, uh, we don't know what's going on. When will we get back to normal? Will we ever get back to normal? And in the film, things started to normalize toward the end, but um, not sure everything came back together. But you definitely tapped into just the, the fear, the underlying anxiety that some of the characters had. Um, that That's certainly going on right now. Uh, a lot of people have no idea what to expect with this virus. There's a lot of information out there um, sometimes there's conflicting information, information overload. It's really helpful sometimes uh, if the information that was coming at us was, was crystal clear. And um, maybe the, the film took a few liberties by uh, offering a little bit more clear information than maybe what we're getting today. Yeah, I think, sir, I mean, I, I imagine you felt the same way. One of the things that absolutely floored me when I watched the film this time was that Sanjay Gupta, who we all have been watching like in the same way that we kind of watch Dr. Fauci on, uh, you know, in on the White House briefings, we all turn to Sanjay Gupta for commentary on CNN, and he's in the film, playing the role of a medical professional commenting on TV, uh, and that, as you said, that sort of yearning for information. I, I, I can't help but ask someone like you, especially what what you make of of the responsibilities maybe of physicians and scientists who are on TV, kind of commenting on this, and the way that in the film he's. Gupta is both kind of a fact finder, but but uh, he, he, you know he's pretty suspicious about the Forsythia, but he's also accusing the government of covering up some information. Uh, I just I can't help but wonder what it must feel like to be a, a medical professional now and and versed in the sort of skepticism of the scientific method and and the, the fact that we need to be careful about all kinds of claims and how you balance that against our our desperate need in some sense for for hopeful information for something to hold on to about when this might come to an end? Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, you do find that you know, as a medical community, we, we really do have to fall back on the science. And uh, the problem with, with uh, COVID-19 is that there's just not a lot of science yet out there. This is a novel virus, just like the virus in the film, meaning that we just don't have a lot of research and good studies. So we are, are clinging to the information we have, and that's coming out of CDC, World Health Organization, and, and other authorities. Um, the way that you deal with with people, um, you, you recognize that folks are everywhere on the map when it comes to this. Uh, some are absolutely in disbelief. Some are deniers. Uh, one of the uh, comments in the chat is that a number of people are suffering from depression, anxiety, just a sense of hopelessness, feeling overwhelmed. And then you have some people that are trying to do everything they can. I'm touching my face and shouldn't. Um, <laughs> And, and that folks are really trying to do the, do right and, you know, wondering, am I doing the social distancing correctly? Am I really maintaining that six feet? Should I be going outside of my house? Should I go down to the River Parks Trail and walk? Is that okay? What about the grocery store? So the, the way that the medical community really responds is, is meeting people where they're at. You know, if someone, let's say, for example, uh, I see a patient uh, and, you know, they're clearly anti-vaxxers. They just don't believe in vaccines whatsoever. Um, the worst thing I can do is dismiss them and say, now, come on, you got it wrong, and we got to go ahead and get you vaccinated. It's the right thing to do. Um, that's very uh, disrespective, and uh, it can it can really make someone feel put off to the point where it's unlikely they'll come back and see us. So for every person and their reaction to this, uh, this crisis, you, you really have to take a moment and listen to their concerns, listen to what's going through their mind, uh, provide education when helpful, but don't overwhelm people with these are the facts and you need to follow them. So, I, I mean, I'll ask this, I suppose. Do you, do you, are you watching the news as well? Do you tend to watch medical professionals on the news? I mean, so I think just last night or the night before we were watching one of the news channels and they had a virologist from Harvard on and then they cut to some guy at Stanford and they're all, almost giving conflicting information, right? Like this guy's like 
one guy saying, oh no, tomorrow I'm gonna have this, we're gonna have a vaccine like in trials tomorrow. And another person says, oh, it'll probably be 20, 20,000 or whatever before we ever can like get over this. And you know, you, you get the sense of cutting around. I'm just curious how as a, as a medical professional, as someone interested in the science, how you balance that that sort of competing information that comes to you from from things like the, like the news or from the White House briefings, for that matter. Yeah, there, there, there's a lot of information, and I don't watch the White House briefings anymore. To be, <laughs> uh, I think it's a little bit more more stagecraft than, than, than information. Um, but I, I will say this: that um, you know, in the beginning of this, I think we all, uh, at least in my house, spent a lot of time trying to collect information. And you're right; a lot of it was contradictory. Um, honestly. Um, I, I try to limit uh, my access or exposure to too much information. Uh, honestly, I stick to the CDC website. Uh, New England Journal of Medicine, JAMA are both you know, pretty top medical journals and, and they present an honest accounting of the science of what's going on. And I try to follow along uh, with them. I also follow the Oklahoma uh, Department, State Department of Health. Uh, they've got really nice up-to-date statistics, which uh, I can talk about tonight where we're doing uh, how how we're doing as a state, and you know, then I'll go to places like NPR and uh, New York Times and Wall Street Journal, just because these are the the periodicals I subscribe to. But I, I've really cut out most of the commentary, and I try to stick to the facts, and I think that's helped my my information processing and just my my mental state in general. Because there's a lot of people who are you know sudden armchair epidemiologists that don't have any background uh, skill or experience with this. Yeah. Yeah, that's. Uh, I mean, and I, I, that's one of those things that actually it comes up in the film, right? Uh, is is that that also seems to uncannily mirror our situation? Is the the Jude Law character Alan, who is pumping the forsythia and uh, as a as a magic cure, which sounds a little like the anti malarial drug um, that we heard a little bit about. So I wonder how you also deal with things like. I mean, in that case, it's pretty explicitly junk science. He's exposed as a fraud uh, in the film. Uh, but I wondered what you made of that part of Contagion and, and, and how it dealt with the Jude Law character and that the, the plot around Forsythia or the subplot around Forsythia. Oh, I mean, I, there's a lot there. And I, I think there's two major points I'd make about the Jude Law character in Forsythia. Number one is that everybody wants hope. Everybody wants something to be available right now that maybe we was just in front of us and we had no idea. And maybe there is some kind of homeopathic remedy that's directly in front of us that we just haven't accessed yet. And that's a nice sense of, of hope and it alleviates some of our fears that life will get back to normal. This will all go away at some point. Um, the problem is, is that uh, that's, that's not necessarily true. We haven't come up with that magic bullet just yet. Um, but the other thing that, that the, the Jude Law uh, subplot really got into, I think, is the fact that given the internet, given social media, given the fact that so many people have so many opinions, there is all kinds of opportunity for folks to jump in and, and come up with their own theory, correct or not, about here's what we can do about this and let me let me sell it to you, let me offer it to you. Uh, and you know, a, a lot of this is, uh, is is bogus science at this point. We just don't know. Uh, so yeah, I, I think that that whole subplot gave way to the fact that we want hope, but you know, we really don't have any great substance out there. And if people are trying to market something like hydroxychloroquine. We just have to take that with a grain of salt. I'm glad you pronounced that so I didn't have to give it a go here because <laughs> that's why I referred to it as the anti-malarial drug. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I think that question of what, you know, how we get good information when, when in some sense, part of it is we just don't know. There's so much we don't know. And I, I think that's, the film does a good job of keeping you in a position of, of not knowing, um, at least through the first half of it. I think that's part of the dread. Uh, they're still trying to figure out the origin, for example, of the virus in the film. Yeah. And we don't even quite, I mean, one thing that stood out to me, especially about the way the film is made, uh, is it, it does one of those things that uh, I always like to see in a Hollywood film, which is it kills off who you think is gonna be the protagonist within like five minutes, right? So the the uh, Gwyneth Paltrow character, where the film begins, and uh, seems like this is gonna be the story that carries us through the film. She's She's killed almost instantly uh, by the virus. And then we think we might be shifting over to the Matt Damon character, uh, but the film itself is really befuddled in terms of plot. There's not a, uh, 
there's not really a story that it's telling in the sense that there's not like a one character's arc that we're following. We jump around between the CDC director, between the, the family, uh, between the, sci the scientists that are working on uh, a cure, the, the dude law character. The film itself, I think, I mean, I'd be curious to know if you feel this way. Part of what creates the sense of dread is that there isn't really a plot. We don't really have a character that we think that's who I'm supposed to be identifying with. This is the person that's gonna take me sort of emotionally through the process yeah. uh, of this film. Uh, and so that leads, leads to the sense of confusion, I think, actually, that we're feeling now. Oh, I'm, I'm sure that was intentional in the film. Like just when you start to get comfortable, like everything's going to be OK, as you want it to be when you watch a film, then something else happens. And you're whisked away to another situation where uh, a, a WHO physician is kidnapped in a foreign country. And you're like, what, what, what happened? <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> that was a very strange subplot too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I think uh, that was probably Soderbergh's intention is to make us feel uh, not at ease, uh, just like we all feel not at ease with what's going on right now. Because you're right, uh, there is information overload and, and the truth can be hard to find. And there's a sense of just not knowing, is this gonna go on for another week, two weeks, six months? Is this gonna be into 2022? Nobody knows. And, you know, people will sit there, like you said, on the TV and they'll talk about, well, we'll, we'll have a vaccine in six months. Nobody knows. Nobody knows at this point what's going to happen in the future. And those that purport to know, I, I think, you know, they're, they, they really don't know. <laughs> yeah, I think the... I as I was uh, sort of trying to put this film in some context for today, you know, I was looking at Soderbergh and um, sort of where this fell exactly in his his own cinematic timeline. And it's it's weird, actually. He made this movie in the middle of making all of the Oceans movies, right? Oceans 8, Oceans 9. So he was already making these ensemble cast movies that are extremely clever and, and which also have these weird intersecting plots and it's an ensemble cast and even has Matt Damon uh, in most of those films. And all of a sudden he pivots in the middle of this to like, well, what if these guys were like, those are charming criminals, right? And this film is more like, so what if we had an ensemble cast with confusing plots in which it's everything is terrible, <laughs> uh, which is much more like Sex, Lies and Videotape is the film that sort of made him famous than yeah. these kind of fun adventures he was making in the, at the same time. It's so weird to think of those, those films just emerging from the same director at the same time uh, as Contagion. It, it reminded me most of traffic, just the way it hopped around to people who were in the, these terrible situations, looking looking for something better, but but couldn't quite get there. Yeah, I, in my view, this is much better than traffic. I he, he did win the Academy Award for traffic, so if, I mean, all, all props to that. But this was a much better film, I thought, than, than traffic was. Um, well, let me let me pivot a little bit and maybe ask some questions about. Um, a little bit more about maybe some of the medicine, especially that's going on in the film. And we have, we had one question here that was a question about r not here. Uh, and it was funny, you mentioned that early on too, because early, I think one of the first things after the, some of this started happening, everybody was recommending, oh, you just need to watch that little scene from Contagion where they explain r not, And uh, everybody seems to know what r not is all of a sudden, like you said, armchair e epidemiologists all up and down the block, right? Uh, all thanks to this little scene uh, in a movie. And the question here is, uh, what is the R naught of of this coronavirus? As far as you do, do you happen to know that? And and what is what is it as a scale? How much worse is R two than R four or R one than R five? Yeah, yeah so, so great question. And you know, it, I think the film actually did a nice job of defining the the R naught concept. And you know, a lot of us can can kind of groove around that. But th there are some subtleties to understanding it that are beyond the, the scope of the film. So just take, you know, the fact that you may not be an expert if you, if you saw that scene. But that being said, I think the basic concept here is that, yeah, you have r not, which is really a measure of infectivity. In other words, if you have somebody in the film or somebody in real life who is coughing, sneezing, um, is sick, what is the uh, transmissibility of this infection? How many more people are likely to get sick uh, based on uh, that current infection. In the film, uh, the r naught was about four. So for one person, it was likely they were gonna infect three or, or um, four other people, right? So um, that's pretty infectious. So uh, think about the, the geometric doubling, tripling, quadrupling of the uh, number of people that will get infected if you have an r naught of four. So the doubling time, which is another uh, measure of transmissibility will be very fast. And it has been fast in a place like New York City, actually. But overall, the COVID uh, 
uh, R naught is 2.2. So it's about half of what the MEV1 uh, virus was in the film. And what that means really is one of us is going to infect just over two people on average. Uh, so the doubling rates are going to be uh, somewhat high, but not nearly as high as what you saw in the film. Just uh, some um, comparison, influenza uh, is a lot less transmissible than COVID. Uh, it's also less deadly than COVID. But for example, measles, which is not terribly deadly, but it's much more highly transmissible. Um, measles probably has an R0 of about five or six or so. But the other thing that I, I think is important to remember is that um, this, this concept of herd immunity. I don't know if that's a, a new concept for the viewership here, but herd immunity. And you know, something like measles, yeah, it's hugely transmissible, but most people are vaccinated against uh, measles or enough people have been vaccinated that it's not likely to catch wildfire out in society um, because enough people are, are immune against the infection. Until we develop a vaccine for COVID-19, we're not gonna have herd immunity because it's novel, it's new. None of us have ever seen this before. Interesting. Um, well, that, that might actually be a good moment. Actually, I, I guess I should pause for a moment and just remind people because, uh, and I'll let Jeff have a, have a sip of his beer there too, uh, that uh, we do have a cocktail for tonight. So if you're joining us a bit late, I wanna again, thank Eric at Shuffles, um, the bartender who designed the Don't Touch Your Face cocktail that we have tonight, a nice spring drink. Um, and uh, we'll have a link there in the chat. So we encourage you to uh, to tip Eric. Uh, these are difficult times for everyone in the service industry. So uh, do take a moment to tip your bartender tonight if that's something you're able to afford to do right now. Um, and I guess with that local tie and even talking about r not, and you mentioned New York City, which is of course where we're getting a lot of the news now and, it, and, it, and things are dire there just as they were dire in the north of Italy, it seems. What, what is your sense of how well Oklahoma is handling, or maybe you know, maybe we can distinguish between Tulsa and Oklahoma, um, how well they're handling uh, the situation right now? Yeah, that, that's a great question. And uh, just to kind of uh, take a little bit of a step back, what, what strikes me as problematic with what's going on right now is that we don't have any firm agreement among state governments, local governments, the federal government, about what the best course of action is. And I think that that's troubling. Um, it would be nice if you know, every state would adopt the same guidelines around social isolation, uh, around closure of businesses, schools, and whatnot. But you, know, you, you see pushback in different places. And this, this is kind of what makes us America in some ways, that you have folks that are very concerned with the health and um, the physical wellness of our citizens. And then you have other folks who, whose core belief is that individual freedom and the potency of our economy are what come first. And because we disagree as a nation on that, we're seeing different approaches to how we're trying to, to deal with this infection. And uh, I, I would say this, that we're learning very fast uh, what can happen if we don't take pretty dramatic steps in terms of getting people to stay away from each other and so-called flatten the curve. Um, I, I think Oklahoma, you're not seeing a sharp spike just yet. And originally it was predicted that we were going to see something pretty bad on, on the order of New York City in about three to four weeks from now, toward end of April, beginning of May. And now those predictions have been changed that we may not see as sharp a spike as we once thought. Maybe that is due to social distancing um, and people really taking the, these orders seriously. But a problem with Oklahoma and we're starting to see in other parts of the country, like Louisiana, the Detroit area, is that coronavirus really affects people differently, right? So there are a lot of people who will develop the coronavirus, they become sick, or maybe they'll not even know that they're sick. And they'll weather the infection just fine, maybe have a little bit of mild fever and cough, and that's it. But about 20% of people are going to have a much more severe reaction to the virus. They're going to become sick to the point where they do need uh, more advanced medical care, i.e. a hospital. Uh, and some of those may need an intensive care unit. And some of those in the intensive care unit may need a ventilator to help them breathe. And some of those may die. It's difficult to know exactly who's at highest risk, but generally speaking, the older you are 
and or the presence of chronic conditions is really important, right? So if you're somebody who um, is relatively young and healthy, um, your chances of developing severe infection being in that 20% are pretty low. But let's say you're in your mid 60s and you've had some cardiac issues, maybe some high blood pressure, uh, possibly you're a smoker, that's gonna put you in a different category altogether. Then take into account some of the social determinants of health. Are you somebody that can access health and health care? Are you relatively literate about what you should and shouldn't do in terms of practicing a healthy lifestyle? Uh, what is your access to money, job, transportation? All of this is going to affect people disproportionately. And that's part of the reason we're seeing some of the disparities we're seeing now, like uh, a preponderance of people uh, who are uh, more severely sick and dying, who are, say, African American in Chicago. That, that directly uh, reflects historical uh, social and economic legacies uh, that are, are difficult to change in health and healthcare in general. Yeah, it's an interesting scene actually in the movie that that again, it's one of the things that feels prescient and yet the film, it, it, it also feels like a 10 year old film actually, because you have Lawrence Fishburne, who's the sort of one of the senior physicians at the, at the, at the CDC. And then you have the janitor character played by John Hawks. Uh, and the, he, Hawk, the janitor realizes that the sort of, you know, the dot that Fishburne's character is is cheating essentially, right? He's getting his wife out of uh, where is it, Chicago before the um, before the quarantine hits. And then at the, the the sentimental conclusion of the movie is is this same doctor coming back to give the janitor his dose of the of the virus. But the the racial relationship is 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 a bit changed there, you know. So we have the black physician and and the and the white underclass guy, and so the, it it. It wants to talk, it feels the film wants to sort of at least reference very briefly this idea of healthcare disparities, but try to make it purely an economic or even meritocratic sort of question. It doesn't really tackle the the fact that there are, like, like, as you said, what we're seeing now, which is that it is seems to be disproportionately affecting uh, black communities because black communities are disproportionately poorer and have uh, have poorer health outcomes. Yeah, than I would well say uh, not communities. poor communities. So Latino, yeah. American Indian, uh, so yeah, I, I, but it is, it is just a funny way the movie almost knows it needs to think about that and kind of backs away, right? And I mean, it goes to another element of the film actually that I, I know that you might want to say something about, which is we were talking about the things the film gets right and the th things the film gets wrong. And, and and as you said, I think when we first talked about this, one thing that's missing is any reference to the government sort of in the, in the film. Do you want to say something more about that, about how, how it fails to sort of imagine sort of what we're feeling now, which is what you just described, this kind of patchwork states, who's who's in charge, who's, yeah. where do we go to get help, you know? Yeah, there was information that was presented in the film, like you hear in the background of TV, say this many people infected, this many dead, um, but you didn't get a clear sense of, of who was driving the ship. There were, um, there were meals provided, uh, and then there was some riding over the meals uh, by, by the National Guard, I suppose, there were uh, guardsmen that were keeping the states locked into quarantine. So th there was some sense that someone was calling the shots, but I think you and I talked about earlier, it was kind of like the state was invisible. And, uh, you know, in terms of uh, our response, uh, what's happening in reality is that there's there's a lot of visibility of different performers out there. Um, you have people like Andrew Cuomo, who, the governor of New York, out there making uh, a number of statements every day uh, he kind of positions himself behind you know, big boxes of, of uh, personal protective equipment or PPE and uh, is trying to take a, a soothing, calm, but real definitive uh, <clears throat> take on th this is what we have to do as a state. Uh, and, you know, that, that's, that's good, I think. Uh, you have then the, the federal response, which, you know, you have Dr. Fauci, who I, I think is very good and has been pretty clear at trying to uh, bring science into the conversation. But th there's a fair amount of politics and, and drama uh, that is also coming out as well, um, both at the federal and state level, depending on where you are. So I, I think that lack of clarity, that lack of uh, here's what we must do together to achieve best results, may maybe it's just not part of the American consciousness. You know, it, we, we don't live in a state where uh, we, we think of the collective good first, we think of the individual first. And I think that gives rise to uh, the process that we have. But that, that being said, there was a line in the film where um, I think it was Lawrence Fishburne said, uh, we got to deal with 50 state departments of health and everybody is doing their own thing. 
And you know, the film was made about 10 years ago. And today, I would say that there's better coordination now among the 50 states, that um, there is a, a sharing network uh, for public health and epidemiology where um, the State Department of Health heads uh, meet on a regular basis. And they all look at the same dashboards. And maybe this is because of advancement of technology, the internet, um, video capacity, whatnot. But we can see really in real time who is infected, where are the hotspots, where are things worse, like New York City, Louisiana, Detroit, Chicago. Um, we can actually look on a deeper level where the beds, how many uh, hospital beds are open, ICU beds are open, um, who is at highest risk, what about nursing homes and other facilities. So I think there's better coordination, believe it or not, now than there was in the film at, at the State Department of Health level. But how that translates to politics and politicians is is anyone <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, you know, the, the, some of the other things the film gets wrong, it's, it's you know, at least we hope so far is uh, when you look at it, I mean, at, at the most comic level, it gets wrong, like what's going to disappear from the grocery stores, right? There, there's no panic over toilet paper in the movie. And that's clearly just Soderbergh missed that fact. Right? Um, and, uh, but, you know, that, that it, it does suggest some kinds of like, breakdowns of certain kinds of social order. So there's trash all over the streets in San Francisco, right? Like the that nobody's delivering trash. And and as you said, we have like the, the army or the National Guard delivering MR or delivering meals, but because the grocery stores have already been subjected to rioting. And it's like the film and maybe this has to do a little bit with what it has to with you know with the way we're thinking about sort of what essential workers are and how the, the sort of day-to-day -day courage actually of the fact that we still have our trash guys coming by and picking up yeah. garbage here and also the grocery store people are still stocking the shelves in grocery stores and there is a kind of underlying sort of courage to that everydayness that i think the film misses because it so wants to imagine a kind of zombie apocalypse like it needs the trash piled up in the streets and the abandoned cars mm -hmm. and that 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 is one of the things that it feels like the film misses it misses something about the resilience of of day-to-day -day life too yeah, and, and the film also only spanned about an hour and 46 minutes in terms of our viewing. You know, it spanned 135 days or so in terms of time, but it was hard to to feel that sense of, of slow time passage, whereas we're feeling that now. And, uh, you, you know, Sean, you and I uh, just got an email today saying that, you know, some folks at TU are going to be furloughed now as a result. So I, I think the, the fact that we have essential workers uh, and non-essential workers who are getting more and more at risk for losing their job because of the economic effects of COVID-19 is very real. So we are not seeing like, disruption of social order just yet for the most part, but we may start to see more of it, especially in hotspots yeah. again, like in New York. Well, and there is actually a question here in the in the comments. It says, what do you think from the perspective of healthcare profession about sending kids back to school, daycare, summer camps, and things like that uh, after May 1st? Yeah, I mean, that that's hopeful and wishful, but again, it I, we don't know where we are with this yet. If you flatten the curve, let's say, you know, you do have folks that stay home, that don't interact with others, uh, where we are basically not transmitting the infection at such a high rate, you are going to buy time with that. You are going to still see folks get infected, but hopefully over a longer period of time, and that and time is helpful here, because time will allow us to develop better medicines against um, coronavirus, as well as a vaccine. And I think most people agree now that we'll probably see treatments ahead of actual vaccination uh, that will be effective just because of development. And that's, that's how uh, pharmaceutical and vaccine development roles in general. It's much easier to create a drug than a vaccine. Hmm. Well, let's maybe pivot and talk a little bit about the healthcare scenes in the film. I know this is, I mean, you, you spend your, your, your time at TU teaching future healthcare professionals of all kinds um, that, that will go into all different aspects of healthcare. Um, I happen to have some sense of this because uh, Jeff teaches just outside of my, my office. So I actually, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an informal auditor to many of his, <laughs> his healthcare delivery courses, in fact. Um, and so maybe you could tell us a little bit about how you, as a healthcare professional, watch the parts of the film that focused on the doctors. I mean, it it too has a terrifying moment. Um, the the one the doctor that is played by Marion Cotillard, mm -hmm. uh, Doctor Arante, she she's one of these. Another like, oh, here's a star of the film. Here's going to be the hero. Oh, never mind. She zipped into a body bag in Minneapolis. Actually, about thirty minutes into the film, forty five minutes into the film, uh, 
so I, I wonder how you how you made sense or how you watched those scenes that focused in particular on the on the on the healthcare delivery portions of 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 the crisis. Yeah, yeah. So first of all, there was a scene early on when uh, the doctor had to tell Matt Damon that his wife had died, and you know he was I think doing it in a fairly uh, compassionate way. You know, probably was trained or someone in the movie told this actor how to break bad news. There actually is some science around how to do that. But um, <clears throat> the way that Matt Damon reacted, I, I thought was spot on. He had denial and he said, well, well, can I go see my wife? Like he just didn't believe it at first. And uh, then he became angry and you know, I, I expect he went through bereavement and depression, which are normal stages of grief. And I thought that was very well handled. But on, on, the, on the caregiver side, um, you know, I, I think what you are seeing is some people like the uh, Kate Winslet character who are fairly stoic and trying to do the right thing uh, against all odds you know, out there in the field. Um, but I think you know there's a real humanity to the folks who are who are providing care. And you know I, I do all my patient visits now virtually. So uh, I've been very fortunate that I can do that. But I have uh, neighbors across the street who live in your neighborhood who are working in the emergency departments. And you know I, there's definitely compassion fatigue that's that's going on. There's frustration uh, that there's not enough personal protective equipment. Here in Oklahoma, it hasn't become a crisis for us yet, but my expectation is over the next few days or weeks or months, um, when supplies start to dwindle, uh, we may see more uh, frustration with just the system not working, not meeting our needs, not enough ventilators, not enough ICU beds, etc. But you know, a, a number of groups have formed online through social media, just to take care of each other, because we know that it's devastating to have to even think about taking care of so many people or taking care of people who are young, relatively healthy, but getting sick. And some of them may progress to uh, much, much worse conditions. Uh, we, we see a number of people in the healthcare sector who are mourning the loss of loved ones, um, of colleagues who have gotten sick and even died from COVID-19. And then there's a lot written about the family members, people having to uh, watch their loved one through uh, their phone or some kind of other video chat because they can't interact with them uh, in real life because they're constantly being exposed to the virus. So yeah, I mean, th this is taking its toll on, on the healthcare um, workforce. And something else that came up in one of my classes that I think is pretty interesting is sometimes we, we refer to veterans as our heroes. And um, we, we talk about what what great work the people that have served this nation have done uh, to defend us in terms of our, our liberty and freedom. And in some ways that's a little bit of a false narrative because at the same time, from a health standpoint, we're not necessarily taking always the best care of our vets returning from overseas. And I think the same might be happening here um, with healthcare workers. There are heroes today. The doctors and nurses are heroes. But again, there's something of a false narrative there that if we're heroes, why don't you send us more equipment? Why don't you uh, provide more resources for us? Um, why aren't you doing more to help us from a state or local or federal government standpoint? That's interesting. Is there? I'm I'm just curious. Is there something that you think, you know, those of us who aren't state or local government officials uh, could do to actually better support healthcare professionals during a moment when we are looking, you know, hopefully to all of you for help? Yeah, I mean, I, the best thing we can do, I think, as as a as a society, as a community, is really just to follow best practices. Is really stay home, uh, really wash your hands, really social distance. I'm not saying that people should get out and enjoy the outdoors; it's beautiful outside. But just you know, be mindful as you're doing it. Uh, wear a mask if you're going to go to the grocery store. Don't touch your face. Uh, do make sure that if you are getting sick, if you're starting to feel symptoms and you're not sure call your doctor, don't just show up. Um, but we have to also be mindful again of those disparities. There are a lot of folks out there who don't have a doctor to call, who don't have a place to go, or don't have the health literacy to understand what this all means just yet. Uh, let's see, here's another question actually. And we do, I should pause and say, we, we strongly encourage you, if those of you who are following along with us, uh, you can use the Facebook commenting feature. We'll see your questions come up in our feed here. So we would love to have your questions. If you have questions for Jeff um, about, about the virus, about Tulsa's response, about uh, the medicine and the science behind the film, uh, we'd love to have you participate. Uh, there's one question here that says, uh, I know there are asymptomatic 
carriers, those who are infected but not sick. But for coronavirus, are there is there a possibility of people like Matt Damon's character where he wasn't infected and seemed to be naturally immune on his own? Yeah, I mean, it's certainly possible. Uh, we, we, again, we just don't know very much at this point. Uh, was Matt Damon immune because um, he was exposed to this virus but could mount a decent immune response where it didn't uh, affect his lungs and his central nervous system? Or did he have some kind of other genetic uh, predisposition to not uh, reacting to this virus? It's not clear. Um, my sense is, is that there are probably some people now that are immune to the virus because they've been around others that have had it, have been exposed to it and didn't get sick, or maybe they were sick and uh, just had mild symptoms, thought maybe it was allergies or a cold and now are immune to it. And some others may actually be just genetically not terribly susceptible. But I would say this for a new virus that we haven't seen before, it would be unlikely that many of us will be naturally immune. Some of us just might have super genes and the rest of us uh, just may have a little bit of exposure and, and, and for all the rest, we're, we're susceptible. It, it's curious, it, uh, sometimes it feels like we just don't know about this virus, like it's a novel coronavirus. And it also sounds in some sense, like we still don't necessarily understand all that well, how well our own immune systems function and how they vary from person to person, is that? Is that your sense of things? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, why is it that you see some perfectly healthy people getting very sick, like someone who's like late 40s, early 50s, and they end up with coronavirus and uh, end up in the ICU on a ventilator? That's not supposed to happen. It's supposed to happen uh, to older people, 60 and over with heart disease or kidney disease or, or um uh, some kind of immune system problem, like maybe they've been on chemotherapy for cancer in the past. And it turns out that some of us just probably harbor unknown illness. Like we could be walking around feeling perfectly fine and and feel like, you know, there's really nothing wrong with us when in fact we have undiagnosed heart disease, undiagnosed lung disease. Uh, so it really varies in terms of who is susceptible to this. Um, it's Easy to identify if you have someone who's older and has two, three, or seven chronic conditions, they probably are very susceptible to this. But to someone who's younger and healthier, maybe they do have a touch of asthma and just never really knew it. Um, maybe you know they've smoked for a long time but never had a smoker's cough, and boom, they can get really sick from this. Or maybe they have undiagnosed cardiac disease that they weren't even aware of. So it's very difficult to predict at this point. Uh, and it sounds like in some sense, we wouldn't necessarily ever be able to quite predict some of the things you're describing because we just don't, you wouldn't know you had the, the, the very definition is there unknown conditions that we might all happen to have or uh, genetic differences that we happen to have. Exactly, exactly. So there's some other questions here. It says, could the virus have been, do you think the virus could have been affecting people in this country longer than we actually think? Yeah, there, there's now some uh, evidence saying that it probably was around a little bit longer than when it was first reported to come over. Um, just because of, of global spread. But in general, um, what we've done not a great job in doing in this country is testing and tracing. So we don't have any of the evidence. We don't know. And what I mean by that is we South Korea took a really interesting approach to this. South Korea made tests available uh, from the get-go. As soon as they knew there was a case, uh, somehow the government, uh, uh, in combination with private uh, partnerships, they were able to leverage tens of thousands of tests right away for the South Korean people. Uh, we have not been able to do that and still can't do that. But the other thing they did in South Korea was that they traced, they figured out, doing kind of what uh, the Kate Winslet character did in the movie is they figure out where did this start? Where did it come from? Who was the index patient in our country? When did they come from China? Who did they interact with? And did all of that, that puzzle piecing together to really trace and figure out, okay, where are the people who are at highest risk where is this spreading um, so that we can hopefully tamp down some of the hotspots? And in this country, we, we, we have not done that terribly well. So in, in order to really figure out, you know, when, what is the true spread of this? We, we need to do a much better job in terms of tracing. And we, we just haven't, we just haven't. Well, we're just about out of time here, but I do, I want to ask another question. Um, that I, that I found particularly interesting at this moment too, which is you, you're teaching a course that I think is called Introduction to Healthcare Delivery. Is that, do I have the title right? Yeah, like I called in Sickness and in Health. That's the, uh, the title I have for it. 
a much better title. <laughs> uh, I I can't imagine how strange it must be to teach something, you know, to teach about the sort of a sort of general introduction to medicine and society and culture at a moment where what you're watching is what you're teaching at the same time. I wonder if you could just tell us a little bit about how it's changed your teaching, maybe about how your own students are responding in the classroom, what 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 kind of questions they're bringing to you, how they see this affecting them, their own sort of career plans and imaginations for themselves as healthcare workers. Yeah, um, so one of the things I, I really try to point out in class, because this is a moving story and it reflects a lot of what we talk about in my class, from um, population health to ethics to communication about healthcare. And um, I try really hard, first of all, to say this is tragedy. I mean, it's absolutely tragic to watch what's going on. And we, we talk about the narrative stories of people uh, who have lost loved ones, who are very sick right now about the uncertainty. And I think above all else, we, we can't intellectualize this. We have to remember these are real people uh, who are suffering from this disease. And I think the, that's what things like the film help us to is remember uh, the Matt Damon character, the everyman, that th this is tragic. But given all of that, it is fascinating to watch these concepts that we talk about in abstract to actually come out uh, in, a, in a real life crisis and to reflect on them about what is the best way to communicate as a society about uh, an infectious pandemic? Uh, what should be instructions that come from authorities? Uh, what are the ethics of making states compete for personal protective equipment? I, last week, um, we moved online, so I'm not in your classroom anymore next to your office, but um, online we had a long discussion about pharmaceutical companies, and we talked about their force for good in healthcare, how sometimes maybe they could be greedy uh, and can do bad things to uh, the healthcare uh, environment. But we spent a long time talking about hydroxychloroquine. And uh, it was nice to be able to talk about the pharmaceutical industry and then couch it around this, this one drug that has kind of risen as a potential therapy. And you know the, the answer, like every other answer in my class, is it depends. I mean, hydroxychloroquine has at least one study that came out of France that says it can be helpful at reducing uh, the symptoms and infectivity and mortality from COVID-19. But there's another study out of China that says, uh, no, it really didn't have any difference whatsoever. So given the fact that we don't have any strong, great research around hydroxychloroquine and COVID-19, we talked about cases in the pharmaceutical industry where there is good research, where there is good evidence. And these studies took years, if not decades, to to finally complete and we're done with, with best study methods, including what are called randomized trials. So understanding like when, when the president gets up and says, I have a feeling hydroxychloroquine is gonna be the drug, um, that's a hunch, that's a feeling, that's not science. And the science right now has been equivocal and we know that a drug like hydroxychloroquine may be helpful, but it's also got some pretty nasty side effects to it. And it could create some problems, particularly uh, around uh, the cardiac system, and it can actually uh, cause some other problems with the immune system, which can leave people susceptible to other infections. So it, it really depends uh, when you start talking about therapies, drugs, cures. We, we have to look at things real mechanistically. Are there benefits? Are there burdens? And do the benefits outweigh the burdens? And that's part of the theme of the whole course I'm teaching. You know, what is the best yeah. approach to all of this? given the fact that nothing is sure, nothing is certain. And I wonder, I mean, the, I think the, you know, we talked earlier about the, the healthcare workers and the, the stresses that they were under. Uh, I know, I, as I recall, you used to actually direct a residency program for OU students, is that right? Or you oversaw residents? Yeah. And there's part of me that wonders that, I mean, this, this connects to what you were saying earlier, just just now about the sort of, you know how to do good science and of course the movie resolves around the idea that this one doctor it just boldly injects herself with the vaccine and then goes and kisses her infected father and it's like a magic wish yeah. it's like the movie sets up a world that seems pretty familiar to us and then offers us a magic bullet almost as a way yeah. as a way out and in the scene it's a in the movie it's a scene of great bravery and and courage and we see other kinds of courage in the film too so i mean i'm curious both about how you read that that scene of her injecting herself with the with the vaccine, but I also wonder if you could say something about how you 
educate medical students yeah. when it comes to matters of courage? Like how, how do you, I mean, is bravery just, is this bravery a skill you kind of try to develop in? in medical students so that they can go into that room with with PPE or, or is, it, is it just something you either have or don't have in your experience? Um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, and people are all over the map on this. Um, so uh, full disclosure, I, I don't teach medical students as often. I teach one course um, over at OU still because most of my work is now with undergrads. But um, yeah, in terms of preparing, preparing um, our, our next generation of healthcare providers, um, one of the things that I think we, we try real hard to do is recognize that even outside of COVID-19, if you're going to sign up to become a healthcare professional, you're going to be dealing with a lot of adversity. And that adversity may come from just overwhelming numbers of people with disease and illness. Uh, and it's hard to watch person after person after person come to you with these tragic stories that my, my dad is sick, my mom won't stop throwing up, uh, I'm having chest pain. What do I do? And you know, sometimes there's a sense of feeling overwhelmed or, or lost, and then that, that can lead to a sense of dread, which can create burnout. So one thing that we do try to do in healthcare, and uh, we touch on this at the very end of my class for the undergrads, is talk about resilience. And how do you overcome all of the frustrations and tragedy of taking care of people and recognize that some of the frustrations come from disease itself, some come from folks who um, are reacting to illness, like family members or patients themselves who are scared, angry, upset. And how do you how do you mollify or calm down someone who's you know kind of going off the handle? And then how do you deal with the system itself? And that's that's kind of where my my, my specialty of healthcare delivery sciences comes in. How do you make the system better, more efficient to deal with the tremendous need that's out there? And you know there are some very innovative things we can do to restore resilience and make the system work better so that our healthcare workforce doesn't get overwhelmed and does feel a sense of, hey, this is my job. I, I got to do this. I got to take care of these people. And um, I will find an outlet later to, to let out some of my frustration or emotion. Uh, and we do talk a, a fair amount about that. But making the system as easy as possible, in other words, keeping information flowing, not making the just the burden of having to chart everything so difficult, that helps. Um, having a good flow of patients so you're not seeing too many or, or too few at any one given time, that helps. So there, there are ways to make the system better to help improve resilience so that at least that factor isn't getting our, our healthcare professionals down and, and subtract their, their, their so-called joy of practice so they can do their jobs and be brave. Well, we've essentially run out of time. Uh, I think that's an interesting place to end because I because I do want to keep us focused in part on the healthcare workers themselves. That this is a, as stressful as it is for us. It's stressful for all kinds of people. For people working in grocery stores. For yeah. people, as we said, who are maybe out of work uh, in in service industries, all kinds of industries. As you said, even at at, at the University of Tulsa, we had to furlough staff today. So there are stresses and strains on the system everywhere. But I think the you know, think being particularly attentive to what it what it means to go into a hospital today and 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 be there to care for those of us who need it, um, to be in the doctor's offices and take those calls when we're not feeling well is uh, is a really essential part of what we're doing. And so, I mean, I I certainly am grateful to, to you. I'm grateful to the students that you teach, uh, and I'm certainly uh, you know grateful to those all around us who are who are doing everything they can to help in this in this difficult and stressful time. Yeah, I'm grateful too as well to, to everybody who's out there, whether they're working in the hospital or, or like you said, picking up the trash. We, we need everybody on deck. And I, and I salute them yeah. who are putting themselves at risk. Golly. And as uh, you know, and as, as, as you said earlier, there's a, it, it doesn't feel like it, but there actually is a certain kind of, I suppose, responsibility and even bravery that is just staying home, wearing a mask when you don't want to or you feel you know, that it seems in, inappropriate or inconvenient or something when you go out, but we actually do have ways in which we can too, we too can contribute in our, on our day-to-day -day lives. Uh, even those of us who can't necessarily be on what we might, might call the front lines. Yeah. So, I like the quote that your, your grandparents went off to war, you can sit on the couch. So somehow that. <laughs> <laughs> Just don't watch too much cable news and you'll be all right, probably, right? Or watch Contagion too many times either. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> well, 
Jeff, I want to thank you for giving us good information uh, and for taking the time to participate in this conversation with us. Uh, I certainly want to thank everybody that's tuned in to our Facebook stream uh, tonight. It's a pleasure always to have you here for our Humanities Happy Hours uh, and to have you help explore and ask questions um, about these all these topics that we're trying to explore during these times. Uh, this is some of the work that we think not only Humanities, but the university as a whole can do uh, in trying times is provide good information in ways that are clear and accessible. Um, both on and off campus. Uh, I also would be remiss if I didn't say one more time that I'm grateful to Eric at Shuffles for having created tonight's cocktail to go with our drink, the which is the appropriately named Don't Touch My Face, which also means don't touch your own face either. Uh, so instead of putting your hand to your nose as I've done periodically throughout the video, uh, maybe just have a cocktail instead. Uh, you can, there is a tip there, there's a tip jar on the comments on the side. So please do, do leave a tip. Uh, if you can't do that, or if you're looking for other things to do, as I said, Shuffles is renting games. So give them a call. You can go pick up and learn a new board game to bring home uh, over the weekend. Uh, there are t-shirts to buy. Uh, and in fact, speaking of board games, tomorrow we'll have a new post up at our Fridays with the Fellows event uh, where we'll you'll get an introduction to some interesting board games that you can play with your family at, while you're at home uh, sitting on the couch and being brave. So. Thank you all once again. Thank you to the staff of the Oklahoma Center for the Humanities who are actually handling all the behind the scenes technology to actually make this work. I wanna raise my glass to them as well. Uh, and thank you, Jeff, once again, for agreeing to do this. Have thank a good you. and safe weekend. You know, take care of yourselves and take care of your community. Great words, thank you. All right.